Okay, in this video we're going to talk about bone repair. Uh, so bone repair is a consequence of some sort of damage, right? So fractures are going to be a type of damage to bone that are caused by breaks, right? So during youth, most fractures result from some sort of form of trauma. But in old age, you know, fractures can result from a weakness of bone due to the age-related thinning or osteoporosis. Now, in terms of the classification of breaks, there's really three questions we can use to address how the break is classified. Uh, so we want to know the position of the bone, the completeness of the break, and whether or not the skin is penetrated by that broken bone. So for the position of the bone, there's basically two positions it can be in. It can either be non-displaced or displaced. If it's non-displaced, we're saying that the ends retain their normal position. So that the bone's in its normal aligned position within the joint with respect to other bones and tissues around it. Displaced means the ends of the bone are out of normal alignment, and this could be due to joint derangement, where essentially the bones may be displaced from their joint and uh, out of their normal position. So we would use these terms to describe the position of the bone itself. Now in terms of completeness of the break, we can also subdivide this into two major states, complete versus incomplete. A complete break is one which is the bone's broken all the way through. So we're saying that you now have two separate pieces of bone that are separated by the break itself. And an incomplete break or fracture is where the bone's not broken all the way through. This might just be where there's a fracture that extends into the bone but doesn't separate any pieces. Now, uh, the third question here is whether or not the skin is penetrated. And we can say that the skin's gonna be either open or closed, right? So if it's open, we call it a compound fracture. This is where the skin surface has been penetrated and there are fragments of bone that are protruding through the skin surface um, and are now visible um, above the skin. Now, a closed fracture is also called simple. This is where the skin surface has not been penetrated. You know, this is not to be confused with maybe if there are bone fragments within skin, but if the skin surface is not penetrated and, and that barrier is not compromised, then we call that a closed or a simple fracture. So we can also describe the fractures based on their location, their external appearance, and just the general nature of the break as well, although these are the three major uh, categories we can use to describe the, the type of fracture or break. So. What we see here then are common types of fractures. Uh, this one here is called comminuted. So comminuted is when you have lots of bone fragments that are in lots of tiny little pieces. And this is common in the elderly who, whose bones are more brittle. So you find that a comminuted fracture is where you have lots of tiny little uh, loose pieces of uh, bone uh, due to that fracture or break. Now a compression fracture is where the bone's actually crushed. And you can see here along the spine, where in the, in the body of the vertebrae here, if it's been crunched together, we would call that a compression fracture. And this is more common in porous bones, you know, ones that are osteoporotic or, and subjected to extreme trauma like in a fall. But if you look at the body of a vertebrae, you know, in cross-section, you'd find that it's actually mostly spongy bone, which is why these are more commonly going to have compression fractures. Spiral fractures are those which, you know, the fracture just kind of spirals longitudinally around the bone. It's a common sports fracture due to like twisting of the of a limb, you know, to, in a fall of some sort, or if your limb gets trapped uh, in some way. Now, uh, it's a ragged break where you have excessive twisting forces that are applied to the bone, which is why the fracture kind of spirals around the length of that bone. Now, epiphyseal fractures where basically the diaphysis and the epiphysis separate and this uh, typically occurs along the epiphyseal plate or even in the epiphyseal line and it actually occurs where the cartilage cells are dying and calcification of the matrix is occurring because calcified cartilage is weaker than bone this is a kind of a weak point in long bones so you're going to find that epiphyseal fractures are more common in children and adolescents whose bones are still growing at the epiphyseal plate now a depressed fracture is basically where you have a broken bone that's pushed inward. You know, typical of a skull fracture, so you have a little divot or indentation in the skull. And a green stick fracture is where the bone breaks incompletely. You know, it's called green stick because it's almost as if, you know, the bone's breaking like a stick that's not totally dry yet. You know, have you, you break that stick, 
but it doesn't separate into two separate pieces, right? There's still pieces that connect the stick together. That's kind of like how these bones might fracture in children whose bones are relatively more organic and more flexible. So you'd find then that only one side of the shaft will break while the other side bends, so it's still kind of stuck together here. And that's why we call it a green stick fracture. So again, they're more common in children. Now, in terms of uh, treatment of bone fracture, you know, it's going to be aimed at reducing uh, the amount of movement and realignment of the broken ends. So a closed reduction is where the physician manipulates the correct position, and an open reduction is where you have surgical pins or wires that secure uh, the ends of those bones. Now, immobilization is, can uh, be achieved by a cast or uh, you know, tr other forms of traction that are needed for healing, and times needed for repair, but ultimately it depends on the break of, uh, severity of the break, right? So we're saying that you know, not all bones heal at the same time span, and not everyone e uh, heals at the same rate because it's age-dependent and also you know, what, which bones are broken. So in terms of bone fracture repair, uh, it actually occurs in four major stages here. Uh, the first stage of fracture repair occurs almost immediately with the hematoma or blood clot. We know we learned how bone is highly vascular, so that when it breaks, blood vessels will also break or rupture. Blood's gonna kind of leak out into spaces, which can lead to a hematoma. Uh, we also get a fibrocartilaginous callus that can form next, so that the blood clots convert to the cartilage, fibrocartilage. Then that fibrocartilage is actually turned into uh, bony material, bony callus, and then we have bone remodeling that, that occurs for weeks and years uh, sometime later. So the first stage here is hematoma formation. This is where we have torn blood vessels that hemorrhage, and when they hemorrhage, you know, basically it's bleeding into a space, forming a mass of clotted blood called the hematoma. This hematoma sets the stage for repair because you have growth factors that are nearby, uh, it prevents the additional bleeding, and it forms a nice substrate for cells to invade and start to replace that blood clot with fibrocartilage. So what you find though is in, the, in this stage is that the site is going to be swollen, painful, inflamed, but also weak because blood clots are not strong. So you know the hematoma here um, is the first stage of bone repair, but the bone is still going to be weak at the site of fracture. Now you can see here what the hematoma would look like. You know, first of all, you have a hemorrhage of these blood vessels when they're ruptured; they're going to bleed out, and because of the periosteum, that blood should be contained within this space here. So it prevents too much blood from leaking out into adjacent tissues because the periosteum can kind of hold it and contain it within this cavity. Now it's going to clot based on normal clotting mechanisms, forming a more solid mass that is going to be soft, but it's also going to be inflamed and tender because of a lot of you know nerve fibers here. And we're also going to get an inflammatory response where immune cells come in and they start to clean up debris and dead cells. Now the second stage here is called a fibrocartilaginous callus. This is basically where new capillaries, or new blood vessels, grow into the hematoma or blood clot. Immune cells, like phagocytic cells, can clear out the debris, and then new fibroblasts come into the tissue, or the, the hematoma here, and they start to secrete collagen fibers that span the break and connect broken ends of the bone. Remember, collagen is a very tough protein. And uh, what happens next, too, is that fibroblasts come in and actually turn this uh, hematoma with lots of collagen already in it, into fibrocartilage. So that we, what happens then is that we get the reconstruction of bone from the fibrocartilaginous standpoint and uh, it secretes cartilaginous matrix and this sets the stage for uh, osteoblasts to come in and also convert this into bone. So the fibrocartilaginous callus is going to basically be where the hematoma is converted to fibrocartilage stabilized by lots of collagen fibers here. This is obviously going to be stronger than the hematoma um, however, you know, it's not going to be as strong as bone. So again, this is still going to be weakened at the site of injury. Uh, you have new blood vessels that grow in and basically, uh, you know, supply blood to the healing tissue. Phagocytic cells come in here as well and also help to clean up debris. And um, what happens too is that osteoblasts can begin to invade and convert this uh, into osseous tissue. In fact, and when that occurs to a greater extent, what we find then is that uh, a bony callus can form. 
So within one week, new trabeculae appear, and you get a fibrocartilaginous callus that uh, you know is there. However, this callus is converted to a bony or a hard callus of spongy bone because osteoblasts come in and they convert that cartilage into bony tissue. Now, this bony callus formation continues for about two months until a firm union occurs. So what happens then is that even up to two months after the break, that's the bone's going to be still weakened at the site of injury. So this is what the bony callus would look like, where you see that their spongy bone is replaced where the fibrocartilage had, had been. Now, uh, the next step here is bone remodeling. We talked about re bone remodeling in the, in the last video. We said it's a lifelong process, and it's dependent on how you use bones. And that even continues with bone breaks. So what we find then is that once the bony callus is formed, we still get bone remodeling where excess material uh, um, in the diaphysis and medullary cavity is removed, but it's all based on the needs of that bone. Compact bones lay down where the reconstructed shaft um, needs to occur because, again, because of uh, you know tension and uh, compression forces would promote the formation of compact bone there. And then the final structure should resemble the original structure as well as the surrounding bone because it responds to the same mechanical stressors. So one thing that's important to note about bone remodeling then is that it's dependent on how you use bones. So uh, there's sort of a new philosophy then with, with bone repair is that you want to be able to have individuals that have had a fracture be able to use their bones as much as possible in order to you know promote proper healing and remodeling of that bone to uh, you know eventually have the bone reconstruct into uh, you know an effective bone. So what, here, what we see here then is basically where the bones remodel. You can see that it looks much like the surrounding bone and tissue. You see that excess comp, uh, spongy bone has been removed here in the medullary cavity. Compact bone has been laid down on the periphery. And uh, this process of remodeling occurs on the order of years. So just to summarize this process, remember we have four major steps. We have hematoma, which is the blood clot. Fibrocartilaginous callus, where that hematoma is converted to fibrocartilage. Bony callus, where fibrocartilage is converted to spongy bone, and then bone remodeling, which occurs over the course of years, and it's where uh, basically the new bone is remodeled in a way that best suits how this bone is going to be used. Now, in terms of developmental aspects of bone, uh, we can actually make pretty decent predictions about uh, the rate of ossification. In fact, we can look at how bones have ossified to determine age, this can be determined, determined by x-ray or sonograms because ossification occurs so predictably that you can look at the rate of ossification or the degree of it to know at what stage of fetal development you know, they're currently in. So most long bones begin ossifying by 8 weeks and the primary ossification centers develop by week 12. Now, uh, in terms of birth to young adulthood, we see that at birth, most of the long bones are ossified except for the epiphyses. Remember, we have the secondary ossification centers that begin to grow later in fetal development, but they're not fully formed at birth. So the epiphyseal plates, though, persist through childhood and adolescence because this is the site of new interstitial bone growth or lengthening. And by about age 25, most of your bones are completely ossified. So we say that all skeletal growth ceases. But this should not be mistaken with skeletal repair and uh, remodeling. Uh, essentially what we find then is that by age 25, you don't get growth lengthwise. There's no more interstitial growth. So someone's not going to get taller after age 25 or so on average, but bones can still remodel and reform based on the demands you place on it. Remember, spongy bones replaced every several years. Compact bones replaced about every 10 years. So what this is showing is basically the bones of a fetus. And you can see that, um, you know, at week 12, most of your long bones have started to ossify. However, a lot of other bones still aren't present. You can see that, that there's not really much bony material here in the knees or the wrists. You know, uh, the vertebrae aren't completely fused. The hip bones haven't, haven't ossified yet. There's really not much bones in the feet either. Uh, but this is, again, only at week 12. So there's only several months in field development. And you know, think about it, it makes sense, though, how you don't want bones to be fully ossified because... Uh, you know, labor is, you know, a challenging process. And so we don't want our bones to be fully rigid by the time the fetus needs to pass the birth canal. So it's important then that some ossification occurs before birth, but that it's not totally complete. That way, you know, the skull can kind of change shape as it passes through the birth canal and the limbs are more flexible as well because they're not fully ossified.
Now, in terms of other age-related changes in bone, we find that in children and adolescents, bone formation exceeds resorption, so that males uh, also have a, tenor, uh, a greater tendency towards uh, thicker sort of uh, bone mass than females, but again, that's just on average. And um, But in young adults, both are pretty well balanced, so you find then that bone resorption and, break, and, uh, and deposition are well balanced. However, uh, in adults, and as we age, bone resorption exceeds formation, and eventually our bones become brittle. But one way to prevent excessive bone resorption is just use those bones, right? There's this adage in biology, you use it or lose it, and if you're using your bones throughout adulthood, you're going to prevent resorption and therefore prevent the weakening of bones. Now, bone density changes over lifetime are largely determined by genetics. So we find then that, you know, osteoporosis can, you know, run in families, and it can relate to vitamin D metabolism, and uh, an individual's vitamin D uh, uh, usage early on can uh, tell us about their risk for osteoporosis later. Uh, bone mass and mineralization and healing all decrease with age, beginning in the fourth decade. So the fourth decade is your 30s. And uh, except for the bones of the skull, we find that bone loss is greater in uh, whites and in females. So especially white females are be more prone to osteoporosis. But again, one way to prevent osteoporosis is adequate diet. So, right, so getting enough calcium and vitamin D in your diet, preventing inflammation because inflammation promotes resorption, and also using your bones because if you use them, you don't lose them. And this is also going to promote deposition.